Ruiz. Funkateers, Bootsy here to bring the Truth and Rhythm family's attention to Funk Not Fight. Yeah, this is a call to action. We spread hope, not hate, uh, to gain satisfaction throughout our communities via the music uplifting unity. Uh, Peppermint Patty, tell us a little more. Thinker is our partner. Thinker music, that is. So please check the link that's scrolling across the bottom, click it, and submit your music. Let's all funk, funk not, not fight. fight. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. I want to talk about your first solo album, but okay. uh, before I jump into that, just real quick, uh, something that came before that I wanted to mention was chill. Cause that was really, <laughs> that was really funky, man. I got to bring that wow, up. Wow. Chill. That's going back, bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chill. What do you want to know? <laughs> uh what could you tell people about that project you know i mean that's the one killer groove for sure but you did a whole album right yeah yeah, yeah. I, I did a majority of the record but uh chill again this was part of the uh jam power records you know air time the era that i was in i was there for like two years solid like with jam power and in those two years, like I said, I worked with many artists and Chill was one of those bands that I worked with. Uh, they're a great bunch of guys, man. I, I really enjoyed working with them. Uh, my favorite song from them was a song I did called 16. I did a song called 16. Well, I actually played all the instruments, but they were a band, but it was just, uh, I, I played everything, but it was the lead singer God, I can't think of his name right now, but he was the lead singer and he did all the backgrounds and leads and the guys came in, did some chants and whatnot. But that was the first, I think, record where, you know, people said, oh, OK, so this dude, you know, he's like, well, I'll put it like this. Uh, Brown Mark, who's the bass player for Prince. I remember when I first met him, he said, yo, I heard some stuff you did. And I heard that she played everything. And he just looked at me. He goes, dude, he said, you're like a dark-skinned prince. <laughs> <laughs> he called me. And from this moment to this day, he still calls me that, a dark-skinned prince, which is mm -hmm. really funny to me. You know, I don't know why it just is. But coming from Brown Mark, I, I, would, I guess I'll take that as a compliment. You know? Well, just out of <laughs> curiosity, how, how tall are you, Chucky? 5'10". So you could be a taller prince too. Yeah, taller prince. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess so. But he just, but he just used the, you know, the dark skin. You know, <laughs> it, just, it cracks me up. <laughs> yeah, well, that's funnier than saying taller for sure. Yeah. <laughs> did you ever get to meet Prince? I did. Yeah, I, I met him one time. Well, t actually twice, but the first time I met him. Um, it was, I was with the group Tease. It was 1982. It was a 1999 tour. And at that time, Tease had the same accountant as Prince. And that person was Fred Moultrie. Fred Moultrie was the accountant for Tease. So he got us tickets uh, for the show. Uh, it was at the 
the Universal Amphitheater. And uh, it was 1982. It was 83. I think it was 83. It might have been 83. I don't know. It was 82, 83. But after the show, uh, Fred got us backstage, you know, at the concert. And at that time, I was, you know, Prince was all, always this entity who never really came out to meet people. He was never. But this particular time he came out and I was just like, well, at first it was two things. I was like, whoa, it's Prince. And then I was like, damn, he's small. You know, <laughs> I just realized how short he was. I was like, I mean, I knew he was short, but to actually see him, like, damn, he's, he's, he's small. But man, that dude pack a punch, man. He's like just amazing. So I remember, um, I remember Fred. And, oh, and Betty was back there too. I met her too. That that's a funny story as well. But Fred brought Prince over, and we met everybody. And I shook his hand. I remember he had a very strong handshake, and he said, "Nice to meet you." And I just said, "Hey, man, I'm a huge fan and continued success." You know, and and I just that was my first time meeting him. And he was really cool. He was a cool dude. He didn't say much, but he was cool, you know? Yeah. And that was the only time. Well, I met him again another. It was uh, it was backstage at the, uh, God, it was backstage at the, I'm trying to figure which awards because I can't, man, I'm getting, I'm going to be 60s. I can't remember everything, but it was, I think it was at the Grammys, um, say 85, 85. And it was just in direct passing. He was coming back. And again, um, I was with my friend, uh, Greg Howard, who was a drummer, and he knew him. So he kind of just walked by and he said, he met him. He says, hey, this is Chuck. And, he, you know, he said hi. And I just shook his hand and then he left, you know. So it was just like two times, you know, and, you know, just real quick. But at least I could say, hey, I met him, you know. So so it was it. That was it. It was cool. Yeah. Well, and the yeah. first time wasn't too long after that Civic show. So yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so your first album came out eighty nine, right? Yes. And uh, how did you get that deal? And you know, what did you want to accomplish when you went into that studio? You know, uh, it's it's very funny because um, at that particular time, I did not want to be an artist. I was really focusing on being a, a producer and a writer and a ranger, you know, I, that was my sole focus at that time. And I, at the time I was working with Gerald Albright, uh, the jazz saxophonist. I was playing in his band. I'm speaking with him next week. Yeah. Did he, he'll tell you. <laughs> so my, his manager at the time was Raymond Shields. Um, I was working at jam power. Uh, so uh, Gerald came in for a session at Jam Power Studios in the Valley, and that's where I first met him. He was doing a he was doing a sax solo for one of the guys in the group. I can't remember it was somebody, and I met him there. So I played him. I said, "Hey, man, you know I'm producer, right? If you ever need anything, you know." So he said, "Play me some." So I played him some stuff, and he was like, "Oh, okay." So he called me like the following week, and at that time he lived in Glendale. California. So he said, man, come on over. You know, we could just jam session or just do some writing or whatnot. So I, you know, I went over, played him some stuff. We started working. I played on his first album and then on Bermuda Nights was the one I really stretched out with, with him on that record. But uh, at that time, his manager, Raymond, he had a deal with Atlantic Records with Sylvia Rohn. So he said he was looking for stuff, you know, looking for, for, for songs, for artists. So I sent him a, a cassette tape of some stuff, some instrumentals. But I, I forgot on the flip side were these three demos that I was singing on. But I, to, I swear to God, I, told, I didn't know that they were on the other side because I, you know. So he's telling me about, he said, yeah, I love these instrumentals. But he said, who is this guy singing on the other side of this tape? I'm like, what? What guy? He said, Dad, there was a song on there called Don't You Know I Love You. And I'm like, oh, I said, that was on there? I said, yeah. I said, that's me singing. But I was only doing it as a demo. I said, so don't pay attention to that, man. Because, yeah, I don't really consider myself a singer. I said, yeah, don't, don't, you know, don't pay attention. He goes, no, 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 no. He said, hey, man, he says, I let Sylvia Rohn hear it. 
And he said, she loved it. I was like, what? <laughs> I said, what? He's like, yeah. So he's like, man, would you be interested in being a solo artist? And at that time, I told him no. I said, I wasn't interested. I really wanted to focus on being a producer and a writer. So uh, she was like, okay, cool. So after that, Sylvia asked him, she says, hey, I have a group called The Guys from Pasadena that if you work with them and you can get them you know, on point, then she says, maybe I will give you that shot at being a producer writer at Atlantic Records, you know? So I ended up working with the guys who later became Troop. And I worked with them and, you know, it, one thing led to another. So I just said, you know what? In order for me to, to be known as a producer and writer, I'm gonna just go ahead and take this, this deal as a solo artist. Not really focusing on that because I'm just saying, oh, it's not gonna, you know, pop off as me as a solo artist. So, but I'm gonna do it anyway because it's an opportunity. So I did it, and boom, it's like the rest is history. You know, just didn't happen. I wasn't planning on it happening that way, but it, it just did. That makes for a great story. That's for sure. Yeah, you that's know, the truth. that's the truth. That's how it happened. Wow. So, how did you feel when it blew up like it did? I was shocked. I was I was really surprised because I was not expecting that to happen like that. I, I just didn't. I was completely caught off guard, Scott, like caught off guard, man. <laughs> now it's like all of a sudden now I have to start doing this promotion, being going on TV shows and all that. I, I just wasn't prepared for that at that time. You know, I was just so much of a, just a studio musician and, you know, I was I just really wasn't expecting that at all. Well, like, well just to, to remind viewers or, or inform them in the first place, three top 15 R&B hits on that. Turned Away, number one, yeah. uh, Don't You Know I Love You, and Touch. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, very, very impressive. And, um, you know, besides that, um, you know, that's my honey didn't chart, but that was, you know, real funky. Yes. That was the one song I wanted to be the first single on my record was That's My Honey. But Sylvia Rohn, who was president of Black Music and Atlantic Records, she's like, baby, that's a great song. But she says, you know, I wanted to be a funkster, you know. So she ended up picking a song that I co-wrote with my good friend Donnell Spencer Jr., a song called Turned Away. Uh, that ended up being the first single. And that actually ended up being like, you know, the biggest record of, you know, off that album. So she just had a different um, outlook for me. She didn't want me to just be known as a funkster, you know, and she's, you know, now I can look, I look back at it. I'm like, you know, she was correct. You know, I, she just didn't want to pinnacle me in just one category as being a funk artist. She said, you have way much more cri criteria than just being, you know, a funk singer. You know, well, well, I go back to like Ray Parker again and radio, you know, like Jack and Jill yeah. and uh, a couple of the other like mellow tracks were the big hits for them, even though those records had so much great funk on them. Right. Right. You know, um, but keep your guard up too. that one was real funky also. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's just like I said, I, I was just being myself, you know, just being myself and get my mom to you know jam on it you know and it, that was a lot of fun man it's a lot of fun did you go out on tour for that that first record i did not i did not i actually well i mean if you want to say that the that the the janet jackson tour me opening up that it was that album so technically i did you know because i was her opening act and we did perform songs from that first album so yes that was considered part of touring off that first album. It was the second album that I did not tour off of. So the second album, what did you want to do differently? You know, what was your mindset going into that? Again, my mindset was just being as uh, diverse as possible. Uh, I just wanted to have a very diverse record. I didn't want it to be just a funk record or just a ballad or a slow, you know, I, I, 
try to cover all genres as much as possible. So I, I just like to have a very diverse, you know, approach to what I do. It doesn't, so it doesn't mean that I have to be like that with other artists that I work with, but just for me in general, as being an artist, I felt it was important to try to stretch out and uh, have as much diversity as possible. And I felt I accomplished that. Well, that record also another number one with games. Yes. And, um, you know, uh, all the singles were slow or kind of mid-tempo stuff, but yeah. that record was full of great funk, man. Um, Again. You know, yeah. love, I got to mention these love is medicine. Yeah. I get around frontline. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. <laughs> I'm a funkster at heart, you know, but again, you know, Sylvia had other, you know, she had other, you know, views for me, you know, I, I, I yeah, I, I'm a funk guy at heart, you know, but again, she chose the right record, I guess, for me to, you know, to get, to get out there, you know, she, she made it go number one, so I wasn't complaining. Soul you know? Trilogy uh, was on there too. Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, I mean, I think it's, you know, one of the best funk uh, flavored albums of the 90s. Thank you. I, man, yeah. that, uh, yeah, I appreciate that, you know, especially coming from you. Uh, I really, really, really do appreciate that for you saying that. Um, I, I felt good about the record, you know, even though it probably wasn't like a super, super, super duper successful record, but sometimes, um, you, you can't you can't look at it as you know sales all the time you know you, you have to look at it as okay this is my body of work this is what's going to you know hold me down even when i'm long gone this is you know this is going to be something that people are going to listen to to say hey you know this guy for the majority you know played every instrument on the record but he really focused on trying to make a a great product you know and i want people to be able to listen to it and say hey you know this guy did the best he could you know to make it to make it work to make it pop yeah well i mean for people that don't know you know who want funk or into the funk and maybe missed out on that because of what the single choices were right, definitely right. go find it and jam it hard yeah yeah uh, yeah so Props to you, not only on the success, but also keeping the funk alive, Chucky. Thank you. Um, so after that, you you worked with people like, uh, how'd the Ray Charles thing come about? Oh, wow. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was uh, actually, uh, at the time, my uh, publisher at the time, Dale Kawashima, who worked over at Big Giant Records, signed me. Uh, he had this project and said, hey, man, we would love for you to work with Ray Charles. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, this guy is he's an I, living legend at that time, you know, world icon. Yeah, why not? So I, uh, you know, I, I did this song with him called, it's, it's called The Right One. It was a funky track, too. Super funky. It went probably the funkiest track Ray Charles has ever done, you know, and uh, but he came in and, you know, he's, um, I remember going to his studio in LA and I played the track for him and he, you know, he's like, Ooh, he said, boy, that, 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 that show us some funk down. He said, that's some funk down. He says, yeah, I, 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 I can do something with that. I'm like, okay, cool. You know? So we did the session and man, he, he, he did like two, two takes. That was it. He nailed it, man. Unbelievable. Two takes. Just nailed it. Yeah. So that was cool. Wow. Yeah, I had a lot of fun working with Ray. That's amazing. And um, you worked with um, uh, the Callaway Brothers? Yes. Worked with the great Callaway Brothers. And yeah, I did a played on a song called I Want to Be Rich. Yeah. Yeah, that was really cool. Those are some cool dudes, man. I love those guys. Uh, I remember I was I was working on a session uh, for I was working with Angela Wimbush uh, at a um, studio, and then they were in. I was in room A, they were in room B, and I just happened to walk out, 
and Cito Callaway was right there. And Cito was like, hey, check out, like, hey, what's up? He goes, man, you just the person we're looking for. We're trying to find a keyboard player. We couldn't find anybody. So, man, you think you could do this real quick session? But I was in session with, with Angela Winbush. But I said, let me hear it. So I heard it down one time. I said, give me a track. So I played it down real quick, did it, one take. And then I'm like, yo, I got to go back to this other session. And they kept what I did on, on that track. And there it was. And that was the big hit, too. It was big for them, which was cool. Yeah, yeah it was super cool. It was had, super you ever, cool. had you ever seen Midnight Star back in the day? Oh, yes. Those dudes used to kill. Oh, my God. Midnight Star live? Man, you don't want to see them dudes live. <laughs> and you better be on point because, man, they used to kill it. Oh, man. And the, what I mean, not just with the arrangements and just the, but man, they sound just like their records. Like they really had all the parts. See, as a musical director, for me, it's always about the parts. You know, it's about the synth parts. Are you playing the right bass parts? You know, and they, they had the right mindset. Just like, hey, let's go in here and let's break these parts down just like it is on the record. That is so important to me. And they just nailed it every time. I love them. You know, live Midnight Star, kill it. Kill that, it. That Callaway family, they ran it like with military precision. Yeah, absolutely. And it shows. It shows, yeah. And what would you do with In Vogue? Oh, wow. You know what I did with In Vogue? Uh, I just did a – it was a um, – a speaking part on one of their albums. Yeah, I just did the intro for it. I didn't really play anything. I just did a speaking part intro for it. It was like a skit they had, you know. And then, but then later on, I ended up, I was going to be their musical director uh, for one of their tours. So I kind of connected with them. And right when I was gonna, going to uh, put the show together for them, I got a call to work with Tina Turner for her tour. So I called my boy Cornelius Mims. I called Corny to take over as MD for me to do that gig. So I couldn't do it, but I was about to, but I did. So wow. that's my only connection with, with the girls. Oh, and but wait a minute, but I forgot. I also did a Christmas song for them called Silent Night for In Vogue. I, I did a song. For, I forgot about that. God, everything's coming back. But I did a song called Silent Night. That was like a funky Christmas track for them. I kind of done it. I did it in the, I did it like within the environment of like their uh, hold on to your love. You know, that song in the hold on. I kind of did it kind of like in that vibe, but it was a Christmas song. And it, it, it did well for them. It did well. Did you ever cross paths with uh, Foster McElroy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. Those are my boys. Yeah, I'm cool. Yeah. yeah. All the time. We we used to really keep in touch up until, you know, the last few years, you know, it's uh, since COVID, we really haven't like kept in touch too much. But yeah, but every time we, you know, I'll run into them somewhere or they'll give me a buzz or whatever. We'll just say, hey, what's up? But yeah, those are my guys. They, you know, they don't get as much acclaim as like a Teddy Riley, no, but they were no. right there, man, for me. Those guys, they, they did their thing, man. For Bay Area, they... They made the Bay Area pop, man, for real. Yeah, and they, and they do deserve a lot more, you know, than, than what they have gotten, in my estimation, anyway. Yeah, so that's what I'm about. So, um, yeah. But you also worked with, uh, I'm not going to name every project, but I'm just uh, cherry picking some. But, uh, yeah. well, you mentioned Tina Turner. What was she like to, to deal with? Wow, that was, you know, for me, I think that was one of the most eye-opening experiences for me. You know, um, how I got the gig was unbelievable. I, I was, at the time, I was touring as a musical director for a new edition. And I don't know if you've seen the new edition movie or whatever, but that scene when at the end, when they, you know, cats bringing guns up on the stage and they had all their crews fight these crews and all that. I was a part of all that craziness all the water holes with Bobby Brown and all that stuff. I was, and you know, 
for me, it was all about the music. So I really didn't relate to all of that. So I'm thinking if I get an opportunity to get out of this nonsense, you know, they're much older now, so they get it now. But back then, it was just a whole nother, you know, it was just a whole nother thing, man. And I wasn't a part of that. I, I wasn't feeling that. Um, so I said, if I get an opportunity to get out of this, I will. Because I'm not, I'm not with all that nonsense, that foolishness. I'm just not. You know, I'm, that's just not me. Uh, I got a call from Roger Davies. This is right at the end of the New Edition tour. I got a call from Roger Davies, who was the manager for Tina Turner. He was also the manager for Janet Jackson when I was uh, her MD. Roger called me and says, we have, an, we have an issue here. We have an incident. They said that her uh, keyboard player, they had just kicked off a world tour. It was the private, uh, what was it? It was the, the Wildest Dreams tour. Just kicked off. They had only done one show, one show, and they had started in New Zealand. And they only did one show. The next day after the first show, her longtime keyboard player, Kenny Moore, dies at the beginning of the tour. So they were contemplating, are we just going to shut it down? Are we just going to, you know, because Kenny was a very intricate part of that show. Uh, so they said, well, who can we get to get in here, you know, to do the show? So Roger Davies calls me and says, hey, first of all, I know you're doing New Edition. And I told him, no, I'm not. If it has to do anything with me and Tina, I'm up out of here. You know, I'm gone. I'm, I'm done. You know, I mean, to the point to where checks was bouncing, you know, I wasn't getting paid. I'm like, man, this is, what is it? Just tell me what you need, Roger. What do you need? So he says, I need you to come in here. This was not, mind you, this was a Tuesday. He called me. He says, can you come in here and, and do this show? I said, how many songs? He said, it's 28 songs. Our next show, they said they canceled the show, that which was on Thursday. The next show is going to be on Saturday. It was a Tuesday. He said, it's 28 songs. I'll, I will Delta Dash you a tape of the show. I got the tape the next day, that Wednesday. I had Thursday to learn it. I learned 28 songs on Thursday. I left out Friday. Got there Saturday, the day of the show, at 5.30 p.m. Show started at 9. I got there at 5.30. I met with Tina. We kind of, she had a piano in her room. She said, hi, hi. I know we don't have time. Let's just briefly go through all the songs. So she had a piano. We went through all the songs. By the time that was like 6 30, 7 o'clock, 9 o'clock, boom, I did the show. <laughs> wow. That was it. And I, and I was with her for three years after that. So, <laughs> <laughs> do you even remember that first show, or are you just so in a daze you don't really remember it? it was, I was in a daze because I was so busy trying to learn all of those songs. I'm like, oh my God, you know. Then I had to plus, and then on top of that, I had to sing. So, and she used to crack me up because Kenny was such a dynamic singer. I mean, he was such a great singer. Like, you know, he had that old school, that old school uh, gospel. That, ah, hey, hey, you know, he had like all little, of that. Little Richard kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. And you know, and I'm, I'm not that kind of singer. So when it, but I still had to, you know, try to emulate his parts and play at the same time. And Tina just used to crack me up because. I remember we had a rehearsal after that. Uh, we were in we were New Zealand. And she said, let's go for this party. So I did the part. And she goes, stop, 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 stop. She goes, Chucky. She said, you can play the piano. She said, but you sound like a white boy. <laughs> <laughs> I just started dying. Because it, 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 was, it was just funny. And she was just like that. Just Oh, she used to crack me. She, man, Tina used to crack me up, man. She was just funny. But. That was one of the toughest gigs because you, I mean, I just could not stretch out too much. I had to play exactly what Kenny Moore played in, in order for her to feel comfortable. I had to become 
Kenny Moore on the piano. So I had to learn every nuance of how Kenny played. You know, that's, I mean, it was, it was actually fun because it really tested me, you know, but it was cool though. It was cool. I mean, we got through it and, but that was a tough gig, but it was, a, it was fun too. It was fun. Uh, that was in the mid nineties. That was 97. Yeah. Wow, 97. man. Yeah. I'm thinking it was probably a little bit different of a demographic too, from what some of the other stuff you had done. Totally different. Extremely like night and day, you know, cause mind you, I just finished uh, doing a uh, new edition. And before that it was TLC. So it's totally different demographic, totally different, you know, music genre, you know, but again, I feel comfortable because like I said, growing up, I used to play a lot of gospel, you know, with my mom and my grandma in church. So it had that old school flavor. So that's why it, it wasn't an issue for me. But learning 28 songs in a day, thats I wouldn't recommend that to nobody. <laughs> were, were your parents still around at that point? My mother was. My mom yeah. was. So yeah. did she get a kick out of knowing that you were doing that? She did. Yeah, she went to the concert. She, she enjoyed it, you know, because we did the Greek theater. And yeah, my mom, she loved the show. She's like, wow. And, and the crazy thing was that she knew Kenny Moore, you know, the gospel player, you know, but the gospel pianist, you know, that uh, Tino had at the time, you know, she knew him. So she said that she thought it was cool that he kind of, you know, took over the reins, you know, for that particular show. So it was cool. It was cool. It, it was cool. And Greek theater is one of my favorite venues. Love it. Yeah. See many great shows there too. Yeah. Um, you worked with uh, Diana Ross? Yes, I did. Yeah, I, uh, I uh, wrote and produced a song for her called Sugar Free. Now, mind you, I never was I never met her, never worked in the studio with her, but uh, she, she would not allow any producer to be with her in the studio while she did her, her vocals. So I just had to send the tracks, the multi-tracks to... Connecticut, and she had her own, uh, you know, um, engineer. And so I just had to tell her what to sing. Like, hey, you know, I, I had to put a guideline down and just said, sing it like this. So I had to, you know, work with what I had, you know, at that time. I didn't, couldn't really work with her hands on, but hey, that's Miss Ross. Did you get to meet her, though, at some point? No. Oh. Never. <laughs> yeah. Never mattered. Wow. But she but she liked the song. So, you know, that's all that matters. You know. Yeah, I'm not yeah, I'm not hung up on that kind of stuff, man. It's like, hey, yeah, if I meet you, I meet you. If I don't, I don't. It's all good. But if you like my work, hey, that means everything. And she liked that song. So that's all that matters. What about Angela Wimbush? Get to meet oh, her. I love Ange Angela Wimbush. She is amazing. Super that talent. Yeah. Woo, you talk about talent beyond talent, dude. She's like, I mean, her, her playing, her singing, her performing. To this day, like, you, if you're on a show with Angela Wimbush, man, you, you better bring it because she's going to rip you down, boy. She's going to take you down, boy. <laughs> she, yeah, she puts on a show. And she, she got the multi-octave range, too. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah. Where are you out? I love working with her. She's cool. That's like my big sis, man. Yeah, she's cool. And you worked on Philip Bailey, uh, at least one of his projects. Yes, I did. Yes. Yeah, I worked on his solo album. Uh, the second one. I can't remember the name of it. Oh, it's... Uh, God, what's the name of that record? I can't think of the name of the title album, but yeah. It's uh, Stay Right Here? Yeah, Stay Right Here, yeah. But I, I did the title track. I did Stay Right Here. Another one called Something's Missing and another one called Live It Up. Live It Up was, was kind of funky. That was a real funky one. I did. I'm, I'm glad that, that Philip let me stretch out on that one a little bit. So it was a lot different from, you know, his EWF days. You know, he kind of wanted to stretch out too. So that was kind of cool, you know, to work with Philip. That's my guy too. Yeah, yeah. 
Did you ever work in any studios outside of Los Angeles? Man, I've worked in a lot of studios. Uh, man, I've pretty much, man, I've worked at uh, Air of London. I worked at Battery in New York. I, I mean, I've worked at uh, tons of studios. Can't they, can't remember them all. But I worked at Sony in the UK, and, and that, that's a great facility. The Sony Studios in, in the UK and London is just off the charts. Great, great vibe. Great board too. Yeah, it's yeah. I yeah, I've worked in so many. I can't I can't even remember them all. To be honest with you, you worked with Burnett Cooper. Yes, I worked with with BD Burnett. Actually, Bernadette used to be the drummer at my mom's church, which is really cool. So growing up, you know, I'm like 12 or 13. I had this big crush, biggest crush on Bernadette. It was like, how many girls do you know that play drums? She has a dress on the church. She pulls her dress up just so she can put on her Chuck Taylor and start jamming, playing the drums, man. It was crazy. So it's like having... Bernadette Cooper played drums. They'd have Mickey Howard in the in the choir. My mom was a choir director. And you had all these cool entities, you know, growing up. And I was just like this little kid, you know, in the audience, just getting a front row seat to all of this stuff. You know, it was, it was really wow. super cool. That is cool, man. Bernadette's yeah. been on. I'm going to have Mickey on real soon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the <laughs> now, I've listed on your credits, although I don't see any on the records, but um, did what did you do with Stevie Wonder? Oh, you know, I worked actually with, he had a group. Um, he had a group called uh, the Funky Divas or Diva uh, that is out. Like, actually, you can check out some of the music now. I, I'll give you a link to it. But there's four young girls, but they got an old school feel and man, they sound great. They sound amazing, They're amazingly great. But uh, yeah, and I've you know I've done some stuff in the past, you know, with Stevie doing sessions and you know doing a lot of work with him. I still do, but it's just now it's just I'm really working on his his uh, girls group. So how old are they? About they're like twenty twenty one. They 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 range from I think twenty to twenty four. Somewhere in that in that range. So people should keep an eye out for this. Act. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. They're dope. They can, and they can all sing, man. Like sing, sing. Are they influenced by Invogue? Because I mean, they had the record title "Funky Divas." Yeah. You know what? That's yeah. I, I don't think they were influenced. What I don't think so as far as their their singing, but who knows? I, I don't. I never really asked them that. You know, who knows? They could be, I don't know. I just know they can really, really, really sing like crazy. Yeah, well, I would hope if they're associated with Stevie that they could really sing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so out of all these incredible projects, Chucky, what would be like your top two or three that you're most, you know, psyched about having done? Oh, um, wow. Or most proud of? Uh, I would say, you know, my two projects, my, my two solo records, I, I'm very proud of myself doing that, you know. Um, and then, but if it's outside of that, I would have to probably say the group Troop that I worked with. Uh, I'm really proud of those guys because, again, you know, they're from Pasadena. You know, they came from the hood and, you know, they were just consummate performers and they learned a lot. And they're still out there doing it today, man. So to be a part of their legacy, in that sense, I'm very proud of that. And uh, so I would have to say that that is, you know, I guess I say my my biggest plus outside of, you know, doing my projects. But I've done so many, so I, I can't really remember them all. Uh, but if I'm sure if I really sit down and take some time to really think about it i might have others but as of right now this is the only thing that comes to mind for now fair enough uh, who would be on your bucket list is there anybody that you're really just hoping before um you know you you leave this uh 
yeah. realm that you'll get to do something with? You know who I would really like to work with? Just just because, uh, because, but I would love to work with uh, D'Angelo. Mm -hmm. D'Angelo's, I, I like D, man. D is, is cool people, but he's one of those type of dudes that does everything himself too. You know, he's, he's, he's got his own thing. So, but I'm just saying as a, you know, just something to do, just to vibe and do something in the studio just to mess around with. Yeah, I would love to work with D. I think D is cool. I like D'Angelo. Yeah. Did you ever yeah. meet him? Yeah, yeah, I met him. Yeah, I met D. He's cool. He's cool. He's super cool. Definitely yeah, does I, things his own way, yeah. Yeah, I first met him. He was on tour. We did a tour, a, a show up in Seattle. At the time, I was the musical director for Tevin Campbell. And he was uh, he was headlining the show, and I met him there. And yeah, we we chopped it up and talked and stuff. And yeah, he's cool dude, cool dude. Yeah, yeah. And I'd like to ask guests if you've seen the show, you may know, but I'd like to ask five Desert Island albums. You know, so nothing that you were part of. You know, but okay. five that are you know the most important to you. Okay, yeah, uh, I would say. Barry White Anthology, 1999, Prince, uh, Inner Vision, Stevie Wonder, um, Bootzilla, definitely, and number five, Gap Band 3. Yeah, Those band yeah. Yeah, and yeah. three three is the one with burn rubber or yeah, that's burn yeah. rubber, yearning for your love. Um yeah, Charlie is, is my dude, man. That that's my guy. And honorable mention though, if I had to pick another record outside of that, it would be uh I would pick Everything is Everything by Donny Hathaway. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, his first album was just that really blew me away. So yeah. Yeah, there's okay. a lot of a lot of debate for Stevie Wonder, but Inner Visions is my number one too. Yeah, that's that's him. my record, man. That's, yeah, everybody picks. You know, they pick. You know, the of course the the you know the what's the one that songs in the key of life. Yes, everybody picks. Which is hey, great choice. But I'm just saying for me, you yeah. know, that Inner Visions record did it for me, man. I was done. Yeah. And then 1999, probably my second favorite Prince album. Okay. What's your first? I got to go Sign of the Times. Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah. The two double records, you know, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably 1999 is a little funkier. It you know? is. Man. Yeah. It is. That DMSR did it for me, dude. I was. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I just did a, I just sung on a remake of DMSR. From Bobby Sparks. Bobby Sparks did a, a remake of that song, and I sung on it. And it's so it's kind of cool. You got if you haven't checked it out, check it out. It's, it's kind of funky. I think I did hear that. Yeah, because DMSR <laughs> is my number one funk Prince track. Ooh, that track is bananas. Yeah, I think my favorite funk track by Prince is probably. I mean, as for me, it's Lady Cab Driver. I just love that song. Just, just he just killed it. That and Irresistible Bitch. Those two. Oh, me, yeah. Yeah. I, I just dig that kind of his vibe. But DMSR is, hey, that's like picking apples and oranges, man. It's, you can't go wrong with either. Did you hear that other version of uh, Irresistible Bitch that's a little more raw that they put out on the, um, like the original set or something just a couple years ago? No. Yeah. Yeah. You no, I haven't. That you gotta hear that version too. He's he's like more raspy and raw, more raw in his voice. And okay, I know yeah. he's got a few versions of that, like you know, Chlorine Bacon Skins. That's another yeah. version of Irresistible. And then he's got a few other ones, but no, I haven't, I haven't heard that one. I gotta check it out. Yeah, definitely check it out. Yeah. So, so um, is there any other projects we didn't talk about that you want to uh, mention? Uh, other than I, I'm just, I'm working on a new album right now. You know, I'm, that's, I'm, I'm doing that. I'm working on a, a new project and it's called uh, Generations. 
and it's basically me paying homage to all my ancestors before me, you know, like your James Brown, Prince, Earth, Wind and Fire, you know, uh, all of these entities, the, the uh, also the uh, stylistics, you know, I, I have songs that I've written that are actual originals, but the cool thing is I recorded them actually like they were back in the day. I used all real instrumentation, no plugins, no nothing, you know, so to, to recreate that sound. Um, so I did a, you know, quite a few songs like James Brown. I did a just a plethora of just, you know, great, um, I guess, you know, artists from that army artists from those eras and put them all into one project. So that's what I'm working on now. Wow, that sounds great. How long have you been working on that? Uh, off and on for like about a year and a half, you know, because I've been so busy. You know, I'm still, you know, working with uh, Lionel Richie and, you know, still doing that and d doing a lot of other projects as well. But, you know, it's just as right now, my, the timing has just been really crazy. But I'm getting it done. So I only have two more songs to finish that I'm going to, uh, you know, get done hopefully within the next – month and then after that i'll mix it it'll be good to go so out in 2023 yes yes that's a promise that is a promise and on top of that i'm going to be doing some shows live as an artist me myself as an artist uh sometime in march uh, april of next year so live i'll be on stage doing it so look for in that L in la or wherever all over. We're gonna be hit. We're gonna be doing L.A., Atlanta, Dallas, Chicago, New York, all the major markets. So that's gonna be in March. And you're gonna do the catalog stuff. Oh yeah, also? yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, do yeah. both records. Uh, a couple of surprises, you know. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be fun. All right. Well, that generations yeah. thing makes me think of Soul Trilogy. You know, a little bit of like that yeah. sort of. Absolutely. It's going to yeah. be in that realm. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. All right. Well, definitely look forward to that. How can everyone keep in touch or find out exactly what you're up to? You guys can go to on Instagram. You can go to, uh, at, I have two actually Instagram accounts. Uh, one Chucky Booker, all one word. And then one at Chucky Graham and that's C H U C K I I G R A M. You can go there or Chucky Booker, C H U C K W -I, I B O O K E R at Instagram. So those are my two. And on Facebook, it's just Chucky Booker. So you can reach me there as well. Fantastic. Got it. All right. All right. Well, hey, man, yeah. Chucky, it's been a blast as I knew it would be. And I really yeah. appreciate it. Anytime, bro. Anytime, anytime. I look forward to, you know, hanging out and talking. Anytime you want to shop talk, man, I'm always around, man. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.